So I am Ashi, and I'm going to be your guide today as we explore the world of deep learning in JavaScript, a world that is still very squishy and still rather being born. So I'm not a machine learning expert, uh, sorry about that, but my mom is, or um, I think she is. Uh, she's worked in the field, she's an audiologist by training, and she did work in digital filters for hearing aids, and then later worked on the acoustic model of a speech recognizer. So I remember working in her lab one summer, and people were saying all of these very strange and quite intimidating words, and there were all of these odd sigils up on the wall. And I was kind of overwhelmed, um, and at the time I didn't understand basically any of it. And so this process has also been a process of getting closer to her, where I can now go to her and be like, hey, mom, I actually understand what cross-entropy is. And she can be like, that's great. Can you explain it to me? <laughs> and I think I can. And I think I can explain it to you so that at the end of this talk, you too will know what it is well enough to use it. So I've been learning deep learning out of curiosity, with some excitement for the future, and also with the sense of existential terror that the robots are coming and they're going to consume all of our jobs and possibly our societies and maybe ourselves. We, there might be this matrix pod person situation that's going to happen. And I have some exciting news, which is that the robots are very, very impressive and they're also kind of stupid, like stupid in really fundamental ways. And so they're probably not going to take your job, at least not within the next year or two. But they are going to change it, and change it quite dramatically. And so now is a really exciting time to be getting into this field. There's a huge amount of research and a lot of new tooling available to us. So let's dive in. And before we dive in, I want to give you a single definition, because I gave this talk, and a student was like, so you said tensor like a hundred times, and that's a very scary word, so what does it mean? Because I feel tense right now. <laughs> so a tensor is, if you look it up on Wikipedia, you find this definition that's like, a tensor is a like, numeric field that is closed over some free operation. I would say that a tensor is a block of numbers. And so we can have a block of numbers that is actually just a single number. Um, that is a rank zero tensor, or a scalar. We can have a block of numbers that is a line of numbers, um, a vector, a rank one tensor. Matrices, uh, number squares or number rectangles, are rank two tensors. Uh, we can have these number rectangular prisms, which are rank three tensors, and on and on into higher order tensors that become progressively harder to draw. So I'm not going to draw them. Um, and I've just defined tensors for you because I'm about to talk about TensorFlow, which is currently the state-of-the-art machine learning framework, um, formerly just for Python and C++, and now available in JavaScript. So let's sort of break down uh, what's available in the Python C++ bindings and what's available in JavaScript. So in um, using the C++ API and using the Python API, uh, we can run math operations, these very large graphs of math operations, on the CPU, on the GPU, to be able to do more operations at a slightly lower precision in parallel. And then on the TPU, which is like a GPU, but with even more, even crappier compute units. Um, this is special purpose hardware that Google made that um, is optimized for doing machine learning particularly. It turns out that machine learning is a large stack of really simple operations. And so being able to parallelize over very simple operations is ideal. The JavaScript bindings um, currently give us CPU computation under Node. And then the web bindings use WebGL to um, perform math. Uh, soon, the node bindings, the TensorFlow team promises, will use the C++ backend, which means that we should have performance parity with the Python libraries. Currently, the WebGL bindings that use the GPU are about half the performance of the C++ library, uh, which is unfortunate, but uh, you can do it in a browser, so that's pretty cool. Um, 
The other important part about doing machine learning research and developing these models is the ecosystem around, um, around the core processing libraries that we're using. And the ecosystem in Python is enormous, and the ecosystem in JavaScript is sad. Um, and that's okay. And if, you're, if any of the Propel folks um, or anyone doing scientific computation in JavaScript is here, um, I want to say your work is wonderful and I'm really looking forward to it. And the, the size of the community is currently small, but if the history of JavaScript frameworks is any indication, we will quickly build up a large and interesting and powerful ecosystem of software. It's just currently the case that if you want to build your own extremely large deep learning models and train them on the kinds of data sets that you might need to train on multiple computers in order to access, then you're probably going to be doing that in Python in the cloud. But then you can take those models, and this is the exciting thing about TensorFlow.js, you can take those models and then run them in the browser, which means that you can leverage the power of machine learning in the browser without sending all of your users' data off to some uh, provider in the sky. Um, and you can also continue to train those models locally. We can do something called transfer learning, where we um, cut off the last bit of a model and we adapt it while not having to retrain all of the model's deep layers um, in order to give users machine learning, um, like the advantages of machine learning, without the privacy implications or the entanglement of surveillance. Okay, so I just said model like 500 times. What exactly are models? So let's say we've got this phenomena happening in the world. Um, this phenomena is a snake or is a drawing of a snake. And we want to model it. Um, we want to understand it in some way. We want a simplified version of it. That's what a model is. It's a simplified version of the world turned into math. So in this case, we're going to turn our snake into a squiggle. With machine learning, we go through this training process where we want to find the set of model parameters that lets us fit the world as best we can. And so we could imagine just trying different sets of parameters, like different squiggles, kind of at random until we find one that sort of works on the snake. It's not really ideal, right? We like, could sit here all day. We don't have a great metric for how well we're doing, and um, we don't have a sense that we're making forward progress. So what we would really like is to find a way to pick some set of parameters, pick some squiggle, and then iteratively improve it, sort of do what we would do naturally while improving upon our own knowledge of a situation um, until we find a good fit. And we can do that through a process called stochastic gradient descent, which is how basically all machine learning models are trained. And if you're a machine learning expert in the audience, yes, there's a variety of um, gradient descent techniques. We're going to look at the simplest one right now. So let's say I've got this splatter of paint um, and I want to model it. If I actually wanted to model a splatter of paint, I would almost certainly not do it as a line, but I'm going to do it as a line because lines have two parameters, which makes them quite easy to visualize all of the like, various things we need to visualize for them. So I'm going to model the splatter of paint as a line, and we're going to be happy about it. Um, first, I'm going to throw a coordinate system under it, so now I've turned these into x, y points. And then I'm going to dig back into my repressed memories of high school, and specifically high school algebra, to remember that the equation for a line is y equals mx plus b. So that is, um, I've got two parameters for my model, m, which is the slope, and b, which is the y-intercept. So if I pick just random values for those two parameters, I'm going to get a line. Any two random values will get me a line. This line is not a very good line. So this point is like way off, and these two points are um, pretty off. And if we go through and figure out that offness for the entire, um, the entire set of examples, then what we're looking at is a quantity called loss. Loss, like that sensation you feel at the end of a long relationship, is 
a measure of how badly we did, how poorly our model fit the data. It's a kind of machine learning self-flagellation. And a common kind of loss that we use, uh, specifically in particular for regression, which is what we're doing right now, it's called mean squared error. That means that we take the average of the difference between the model and the ground truth squared. Um, if we were to write it in JavaScript, it would look something like this. We could reduce over our data, find the difference between that data point as our model predicted it and the actual value of that data point, square it, divide it by length. And then that gives us this function that um, we can pass in. Uh, so we have this line higher order function. We can pass in um, model parameters here. And any two model parameters are going to yield a particular loss with respect to this data, which means, haha, because we have two of them, I can visualize it on a plane and say that, OK, this is going to be the slope of our line, its slopiness. This is going to be how high up off the x-axis it is, b. And for some given um, set of model parameters, in fact, for every given set of model parameters, there's going to be some loss. So what we can do now is we can go and figure out what that loss is, and then sort of poke around up there and be like, what if my line was slopier? What about less slopey? What if my line was higher up? What if it was lower up? And in one of those directions, we will be reducing loss. And so we're going to take a step in that direction along both axes. And then we'll do it again and be like, OK, more slopey, less slopey, higher, lower, and again and again. So at each step, we're using loss to point us in the direction of movement, as we all do as we improve upon ourselves, and as our robots do as they improve upon themselves. Loss is showing us where to go, and it's revealing for us a landscape of loss. Um, so the, what we're kind of doing is we're finding the slope of this landscape at each point. The general mathy term for the slope of a landscape is its gradient. And so the process that we're doing is gradient descent. We're just kind of rolling down this landscape like raindrops into the valleys that are closest to the ground truth. So there's a lot of ways we might tweak this process. One is to notice that if we're computing loss against all of the examples, all of the splatters of paint, then it's going to take a while. Um, it's not going to take that long for a line and xy points. But if we have much larger models, then it can become quite expensive to compute loss. And so we might just grab a handful of examples randomly. Stochastically, you might say, if you're the kind of person who says stochastically rather than randomly, um, in order to compute the loss at every point. So that gives us stochastic gradient descent. Um, other parameters we might tune are, for example, the size of the step we take. That's something called the learning rate. So these, um, these quantities, the size of the batch, so like the number of examples we look at, or the learning rate, they're not learned. We don't train them. And so they're not called model parameters, but rather hyperparameters, which is a very exciting word, I think. Um, and the model doesn't learn them during training. Instead, we set it manually when we train the model, um, typically by running hundreds of experiments and staring at graphs until our eyeballs bleed. OK, so that's a line. It's like a very simple, um, very simple function, probably not very useful, right? There's other functions that we might use for deep learning. Um, for example, we might use one of a set of sigmoidal functions. These are designed to kind of simulate the, um, ooh, simulate the firing of a neuron, where down here the neuron is not firing, up here the neuron is firing. And they're smooth because, they, um, because that way they are differentiable at every point. And so for a long time, when I was first looking into machine learning, um, this was a very common thing, one of, one of a bunch of uh, trigonometric functions or strange functions that include E uh, were used as the activation functions for individual neurons because they were mathematically kind of complex to think about, but very well behaved. Uh, and then around 2015, uh, there was a paper that basically was like, no, no, what if we just, what if we just used this function? <laughs> 
which has a fancy name. <laughs> um, it is called, oh no. <laughs> My slides. Um, okay, so that function is called the rectified linear unit, um, often abbreviated ReLU. Um, and it is a very hard function, it is a very complicated function. It is the max of x and 0. That's it. Um, and that function is pretty easy to think about. We could imagine writing it in less than one line of JavaScript. And it turns out that that simplicity and that ease of computability makes it perfect for deep learning, where, again, we are not doing very interesting or complicated operations. We just sure are doing a lot of them. And so we can imagine stacking up these rectifiers. Um, here we're going to have four layers, den or four neurons densely interconnected in two layers. And because they're densely interconnected, we're going to um, say that each of the neurons in the second layer um, f gets fed by all of the neurons in the first layer. So this one, for example, its input is going to be the weighted sum of inputs from all of the neurons in the previous layer. Which, if you think about it, because of the shape of this function, what we're really doing is nesting if statements. We're nesting if statements with conditionals whose values depend on the output of previous if statements and whose thresholds are basically entirely hard-coded. Next time you see, like, researchers at Google have created a deep neural network that does some impressive thing. Just think, researchers at Google have figured out how to hard code 50 million random values in order to do some impressive thing, which is basically what's going on. I mean, the impressive part is obviously that the training process figures out those hard coded values for ourselves. But um, at the end, the thing the model is doing is basically a giant pile of spaghetti code, which fortunately models our brains pretty well. So even for a model like this, a relatively small one, um, if we think about the number of interconnections between these two layers of four ReLU neurons, we quickly see that we've got 16 of them. For a line, we had two parameters, and we were able to think about its uh, loss landscape. This model has 16 parameters, and I don't know about you, but I have a really hard time visualizing 17-dimensional surfaces. Um, but of course, it, it gets worse. So what we're seeing revealed here is a visualization of the loss landscape for ResNet. ResNet is an image classifier, and ResNet has about 60 million parameters, which means that this is obviously like a heavy approximation. Like, uh, these folks have done some really interesting projection in order to get it to even resemble something three-dimensional. Um, it's been said of the terrifying things that live at the base of the sea and will one day wake to consume the world, that they have length, width, depth, and several other things. And perhaps this is what Lovecraft was talking about. <clears throat> All right, the good news is you do not have to train those models. You don't even have to think about those models or hold their lost landscapes in your head um, because you can NPM install them. <laughs> and let's look at that. <laughs> Um, of course, if you want to train those models, I highly encourage it. So we're going to look at an example of transfer learning, where we take a pre-trained model and then train it to do something else, um, which lets us leverage all of the training time on like, the larger, in this case, image recognition model, uh, and then use it for a different uh, problem, sp problem space. So we're going to do transfer learning, and what we're uh, going to do, this is actually an example, you can go and pull it up on GitHub. Um, I'm going to play uh, Pac-Man using my elephant friend, Tallulah. That's Tallulah. And the way this works is I pick a bunch of examples, um, just using web my webcam, that represent the images for up, down, left, and right. And so I'm rotating Tallulah, I'm trying to like, be in the frame, I'm trying to not be in the frame, I'm trying to like, get a representative sense of, or give the network a representative sense of where, um, how I'm going to be holding her, which as we can see, I do not. 
Uh, we're going to train it. Our loss goes pretty low. And then when I play, um, the network is going to highlight in yellow which, uh, which direction it thinks I'm moving. And we can see that it works pretty well, at least until I start getting stressed about Pac-Man um, and not holding Tallulah in the same way I was during training. At this point, I am like, subtly freaking out. Incidentally, if you want to ruin a friendship, using your friend as a controller is a pretty good way to do it. <laughs> and now I'm eaten. I've been eaten. Um, and I'm happy to report that we are still friends. <laughs> OK, so let's look at how this example works. Thing one we do is we, well, thing zero we do is we npm install everything, including TensorFlow. So thing one we do is we import TensorFlow um, from TensorFlow TFJS. The new hot thing is namespaced packages these days. Um, and then we're going to load up the model. So uh, this model, there, are models that you can also NPM install. This particular model is just served off, served off the web somewhere. Um, and because we're doing transfer learning, we're going to kind of do a little bit of surgery on the model. So we're going to pull out this layer, um, conv pw13 relu, whatever that means. We're going to look at what that means. Um, and then we're going to construct a new model that has the same inputs as mobile net, but outputs that low but not final layer. The actual final layer of mobile net is going to be like 200 um, probabilities, namely the probability that this, mo that this photo contains a cat, the probability that this photo contains a cow, the probability that this photo contains a laptop, and on and on throughout whatever classes of images mobile net has been trained to recognize. Um, we want something before that, something where the image has been kind of reshaped into some arbitrary chunk of interesting data, but has not yet been winnowed down to um, what it contains. OK, we'll look at that more in a second. So we load our model. Um, we grab that layer. And then when I'm adding examples, this is what's happening. We're just throwing them into this controller data set, which is building up a data set of examples. And then we construct our model. So our model is going to take the output of that layer of TensorFlow. It's going to flatten it, and it's going to run it through a configurable number. The default is 100 um, densely interconnected ReLU neurons. And then at the end, we're going to have a softmax layer. Softmax is a different activation function, which is useful for um, when you want a probability distribution. So in this case, we want a probability distribution. Num classes is going to be four, because um, we have up, down, left, and right, and that's all we're trying to decide between. So the output of our network is going to be the relative probabilities that I'm that I am holding Tallulah up, or I'm holding her left, or I'm holding her right, and so on. So then we um, configure an optimizer. We're here not using stochastic gradient descent, um, the classic stochastic gradient descent. We're using Atom, which is a stochastic gradient descent technique that is better. It's a little bit smarter about how it, um, the size of steps it takes. Uh, we're going to compile this model with a loss function, and that loss function is hi mom categorical cross entropy, which is a useful loss function when you're dealing with probability distributions. Uh, the reason being, if we have this example, which is an example of me holding Tallulah upside down to indicate down, and the network predicts this, which is technically it's predicting that I'm holding her right, um, how bad is that really? Because uh, this is like, it's pretty close. The prediction is wrong. If these were flipped, it would still be kind of wrong that it thought that there was a 10% chance that I was holding her correctly, you know? So answering that question is what categorical cross entropy does. It's basically like how, um, how much did this model confuse different probability classes? And now you know. OK, and then finally, we call fit. This actually goes and starts dispatching stuff off on the GPU. Um, and we get these callbacks every time a batch is finished. So every time we have computed our loss for something, we've updated the weights, and then we've taken a step. All right. Uh, and to play the game, we ask MobileNet to do its prediction. 
We run its prediction through our model, giving us one of four probability classes, and then we um, figure out which one is the most likely, and we do it. And that's Pac-Man. That is transfer learning with TensorFlow.js. I would like us, though, to go back and um, understand what it is that we're getting out of MobileNet. And to do that, I'm going to load up MobileNet, uh, load up that JSON file that we saw us loading earlier in the browser. And here we'll see that there is, this is a Keras model. Keras is a machine learning framework that lets us describe a deep learning system as a bunch of layers. And here are its layers. Come on, click. Past Ashi, click. All right. Um, so a deep learning network that recognizes images typically looks something like this. We've got um, convolutional layers and normalization layers and activation layers. The activation layers, we kind of know what they look like. They're those ReLU activations uh, that we saw earlier. Normalization layers just ensure that our values are roughly between 0 and 1-ish. Um, and they do it across single batches, which is why they're called batch norm layers. Convolutional layers have all of these configuration parameters. And like many things in machine learning, they sound very hard but are not very hard. Um, convolutions are basically Photoshop filters. So if we have a whole bunch of input pixels, uh, a convolutional layer is going to grab some chunk of those input pixels, run it through a filter, and produce an output pixel. And it's going to then walk the filter over the entire image, producing an output image. Um, you can, you'll notice that if we do this without allowing the filter to slide off the edge, then we'll get something slightly smaller. Um, we can decide what it is we want. That's one of the many tunable parameters. So convolutions come in all kinds of shapes and sizes. This one is three by three. And the key thing here is this filter, which is the same across the entire image and is trainable, which means that, actually, let's just see what it means. So I've gone and gutted MobileNet and put it here. And this is what's happening in each of those many, many convolutional layers that we saw before. And yeah, it looks like a bunch of crappy Photoshop filters, because it is a bunch of crappy Photoshop filters. But the interesting thing here is that the network has sort of started to do things that look like edge detection and other processes that are trying to basically mimic the informational extraction things that happen in our visual cortex. This happens naturally. This happens naturally when you train a system that is able to um, create these isolated filters on an image classification task that mimics um, the kinds of image classes that we ourselves recognize, is it starts to do the same kind of processing that we do, which is an interesting validation of the model, I think. So I hope this makes deep learning a little bit less scary, the realization that it's just a big pile of operations, a bunch of spaghetti code that's been tweaked by a, um, a very uh, simple but big process. Um, and I hope it makes it seem less scary because the world can seem a bit scary these days. Our world is flush with information and our interaction with it is heavily mediated, increasingly by machine learning systems. Uh, the systems are not perfect. They've been trained on whatever data we've given them. And just like us, they internalize the biases of that data. And just like us, they can be pressed into the service of whoever wants to wield them. There's this proof that neural networks are universal approximators, which means that any function you give them, they can approximate to some level of precision. And if you believe that our own, our own cognition is a computable function, then we're moving into a world in which the fundamental tasks of cognition are now things that we can train a machine to do. So these are not real faces. You probably figured that out already. These were dreamt up by a GAN, a deep learning network whose loss function is another network. The two networks improve each other, learning to dream up things that appear to be people. And uh, this is not Barack Obama. This is machine learning generated Obama synced to a recording of an actual Obama speech. Um, and of course, there exist systems that can generate speech that sounds like anyone as well. 
So how do we cope with this? With a world where we can't trust our own eyes and ears? One way is to ignore it and to say that these technologies are not that good. Yet. But if cognition is a computable function, then our societies and ourselves are games. And robots, it turns out, are very good at playing games. In the history of computation, we see these tides. So first, all important work was done on big mainframes. And then processors improved, and work moved to personal computers. And then networks improved, and we put everything in the cloud. And now we're seeing the tide go out again as we begin to realize what we've given away and how much power there is in knowing everything about everyone and how much danger there is in us relying on opaque boxes outside of our control to feed us with knowledge. So my message to you is that these technologies don't have to be opaque and they don't have to be centralized and we can hold the power of robot minds in our pockets. We can use them to create to not just create forgeries, but to discern truth. So this is just the beginning. Everything we've seen here today, I think it's quite impressive. And I think it's going to look downright embarrassing in a few years when you can talk with your robot assistant and the pattern of your voice will never leave your wrist. Thank you.